If you were to take Kim Kardashian and cross her with Ted Bundy, this is the story of what would happen. So buckle up, because you are in the right place. This case begins in the 1980s in Paris. Gabriel Leladier is waiting in front of his school for his dad to come and pick him up. His dad, Gerard, is a lawyer specialized in divorce and car accidents. After some time goes by, Gabriel calls his dad's office, but there is no answer. He then calls his dad's secretary, but she has not seen him today either. This is strange, and with an inkling that something is not right, he asks her, no, begs her to go and check that his dad is in his office, which is also his home. She is not exactly comfortable with the plan, bursting into her boss's office uninvited. But as Gabriel is notably stressed, she begrudgingly agrees. She does, however, coax one of Gerard's close friends to come up to his apartment with her in the 17th arrondissement of Paris. The idea of having one of his friends with her makes her slightly less uneasy. As they enter the building, they grab the spare key off the security guard. But as he gives them the key, he informs them of something unsettling. He states that all night the bedroom light has been on. And he hasn't collected his mail from the doorstep all day. The pair, now more concerned than ever, make their way up to the apartment. They open it to find that the place has been ransacked. They make their way through the house until they come to his bedroom. And there before them, they see his body surrounded by blood. Furthermore, they see that his hands and feet have been bound together. Something awful has happened to him and they immediately call the police. His face is covered in bruises and he has been stabbed multiple times. They also find a sponge has been shoved into his mouth. The police do a preliminary search of the apartment and it looks like he has been burgled. Everything has been rummaged through as if someone has been looking for something, but bizarrely, there is no signs of a break-in. They immediately assume that this crime is linked to a strew of homosexual murder cases that were happening in Paris at this time. Every one of those victims had been found in the same way with their hands and feet bound together. They gather some information to clarify this as it's their main lead. But his inner circle all say the same thing, that he was a ladies man through and through. And although the police are hearing this from everyone in his inner circle, it doesn't convince them because back in the 80s, many men would go to great lengths to hide their sexuality if they were gay. And not that long ago, Gerard had set up a marriage agency that specialized in gay marriage. But it hadn't been the huge success that he had planned, so he was in the process of closing it. Jacoba de Jong, another lawyer who had been friends with Gerard for a long time, learns of his untimely death over the radio. Shocked, horrified and informed, she decides to call the police with some information she feels they need to know. She knew Gerard very well and she knew that he was always dating younger women. A lot of younger women. And what she's suggesting to the police is that Gerard may have come across the wrong type of girl. Well, this is interesting to the police because the night he was murdered, he was scheduled to have dinner with friends and he let them know that he was bringing a date, a young date, about 20 years old, and Gerard is in his 50s. But he let them know that he might be late, so they should start dinner without him. He and his much younger date would join them when he could, but he never showed. The last person who spoke to him on the phone also confirmed this. His mother had been on the phone to him whilst he was waiting to meet up with this younger girl. And he had mentioned that he was planning on taking her to Le Jardin de Beauzy. The detectives immediately head towards the restaurant. They talk to one of the managers there who knows Gerard well, as he is a regular with a reputation that precedes him. He is renowned in the restaurant for his womanizing. Actually, this restaurant has its own little reputation for being just the kind of place where young women can meet rich, influential men. And Gerard dished out his business cards like there was no tomorrow. Except he didn't know that there actually was going to be no tomorrow. In Gerard's diary, they find a plethora of young girls' numbers. And so they contact Kathy, 22, a young aspiring actress who had gone for dinner with Gerard just a couple days before he was murdered. Gerard had promised her that he would talk to his film producer friend, drop in a good word for her, but she hasn't seen him since. 10 days after Gerard's murder, there is a second murder. Once again in the chic and normally safe 17th arrondissement of Paris. Laurent Zerat, a 29 year old man who owns a clothing shop. And when he doesn't show up for work that day, people start to worry. It is his concierge that is most troubled because there has been loud music coming from his house all day. 
She rings the bell to make sure everything's okay, but there is no answer. So she calls in reinforcements from Mr. Zerad's brother, who manages to skillfully break into the apartment. It is a tip, but the most concerning thing is that the bedroom door is locked. Laurent's brother wastes no time and plows through the door in fear of what he will see on the other side. And to his dismay, he sees his brother's body, tied up and stabbed, with his mouth stuffed just like Gerard. Laurent's sister arrives on the scene and is quick to notice that his signature gold necklace, his Cartier ring and his precious Rolex watch are missing. He always wore them, so according to her, they must have been forcefully removed from his body. Once again, we have all the signs of robbery, but with no signs of forced entry. Therefore, the detectives come to the conclusion that Laurent must have known his killer. Two bodies, hands and feet tied in the same way. Both rich, both robbed, but with no forced entry. And both have one very common interest young women. So the police are looking for some kind of double hit murderess with one motive, money. The night of his murder, Laurent had met up with his brother in a restaurant but had left early to go on a date with a woman he had met in a nightclub called L'Apocalypse. In his trash department, we see that there are two dinner plates on the table, suggesting that the young lady he was going on a date with may have had dinner there with him. But one of the plates of food hadn't been touched. They head to L'Apocalypse Club to see if they can find out any details about the young lady. And they don't get a name, but they do get a description. Long brown hair, kind of cheeky looking, dark almond shaped eyes, and quite curvy. Think Kim Kardashian circa 2003. With vengeance in their blood, Laurent's brother and sister make it their mission to find out who this girl is. So they do some detective work of their own until they finally get a name. Valerie. Valerie Subra. But their source also tells them that this girl Valerie, who works in a shop just not that far away from Laurent's shop, is just a kid. Must be 18 max, not older. And in his humble opinion, she is not exactly the double murderous hit women that they're looking for. But Laurent's sister dismisses their source's doubts and she goes straight to the police with this name. The police search through Laurent's address book and find a number corresponding to Valerie. And to their surprise, they find that she is also listed as a contact in the address book of Gerard. Her number is at both crime scenes. As soon as they can, the investigators head to the shop where Valerie works. Once again, they are surprised at how young she is. And she is not in the slightest bit stressed out by their presence. If she was their murderer, then surely she would be worried, right? But Valerie is happy to help, relaxed, upbeat. However, she happens to be wearing a gold necklace and a Cartier ring. They head straight to Valerie's mum's house, as that's where she lives too, where they start searching for clues and they find one of Gerard's business cards. Valerie is placed immediately in custody and questioned. She denies anything and everything to do with both murders, until the police reveal that they have found her name in both victims' address books and they know exactly where her expensive jewellery has come from. By now she knows that her number is up, but she doesn't exactly admit to doing anything wrong. In fact, she is pretty convinced that her role in the murders is akin to swatting a fly. She had done nothing but lure these men in and then the real perpetrators would come in and finish the job. She had nothing to do with murdering them. In fact, when the bad guys came in to commit the horrific crimes, she, being the delicate girl that she was, would go to a different room altogether so she wouldn't have to bear witness to the horrific crimes that were unfolding. Yes, she heard the screams, but she didn't see anything, let alone do anything. So she asks the police if they could wrap things up as she would like to head home. What she doesn't compute at all is that she's guilty of anything. When they begin to explain to her that she won't be going home, she is a little shocked. But not nearly as shocked as she is when they tell her that she probably won't be home for Christmas. So she gives them the two names, the names of the men who organized the whole thing. Laurent Hattab and Jean-Rémy Sarrault. Hattab, who at the time is Valerie's boyfriend, was brought up in a well-off family, living in a luxury apartment in Paris. His dad is pretty successful and 
quick to buy him luxury gifts. For example, his first car was an Alfa Romeo. Hattab was known for being the life of the party. He would be the guy who bought rounds for all of his friends. But at this particular moment, his dad's business had hit hard times. And so Hattab's disposable income had become almost non-existent. Jean-Rémy Sarro didn't have the same luck as a kid. He had been abandoned by his family at a young age and had a tough upbringing, struggling to make his own way and often homeless. So the two of them found common ground when Hattab found himself struggling financially too. Both of the men are arrested and Jean-Rémy's arrest goes pretty quickly and uneventful. But Hattab's arrest is quite different. The police set up a sting at Valerie's house to try and catch him. They have to be extremely careful because they have been made aware that he may be carrying a gun. So whilst he is waiting in his car for Valerie to come out of the house, the police jump on him, forcefully pulling him out of the car window, throwing him to the ground and cuffing him. He does put up a fight, but he is hugely outnumbered. Laurent Hattab, when he is taken in, is wearing a Rolex watch, exactly like the Rolex watch that had been removed from Laurent Zarad. During his interrogation, he will claim that he bought the watch from some guy who he doesn't know his name, but the first to be questioned of the two is Jean Remy, and he admits everything, telling the police exactly how the events unfolded. Their plan goes as follows. Valerie seduces a man and sets up a dinner date. It must be at the target's home address. When she arrives, she analyzes the location for things that could cause problems, such as potential witnesses or any security or surveillance equipment. Once she sees that there are no threats to her team, she excuses herself for a moment and goes to let them into the house. She at this point leaves the two men to come in tie up the victim and brutally murder him. Then clear out the location for anything valuable or money. The trio walk away from their first murder with the grand total of 1200 francs, which is roughly 350 euros or $360. And allegedly this hefty sum was desperately needed by the trio to make their dream of moving to America come true. But first to celebrate their winnings, they hit the nightclub cracking open a bottle of gin and raising a glass to their victory, still covered in the victim's blood. Then they get straight to work to attempt to replicate this first murder. Valerie just has to find and seduce their next victim. It would only be 10 days until Valerie manages to arrange a date with Laurent Zarat. They use the same motus operandi. Valerie goes for dinner and when the time is right, she lets the boys in and together they murder and steal. One detail that does not escape the ears of the court is that the boys find this second murder slightly more difficult. Zarad had said to Atab, don't do this, we are both Jewish. You can't kill a fellow brother. And this admittedly got to him a little bit. So instead of brutally murdering him, he covered his face with a bathrobe and then brutally murdered him. Whilst the boys murdered Laurent Zarid in his bedroom, Valerie sat in the living room watching TV and polishing off one of the meals that had been prepared for her that evening. He was being murdered. This time they walk away with just under 4,000 euros which is roughly the same in dollars. They had already selected their next victim and the murderous dinner date was set for the day that they were arrested. The three of them were dubbed by the press as the Trio Infernal and all of them were arrested and given the maximum sentence at the time. The two boys were given 18 years minimum and Valerie was given 16 years minimum. If you do the math, you can work out that they are all free men. Actually, in 2020 and 2022, both of the boys did pass away. So there's Valerie. If you need more seduction and murder in Paris, then do click this link up here. And if you want to see our channel grow, then please like, subscribe and comment because that's how we will grow. And our final thoughts go out to the families and victims in today's story. But most importantly, please take care of yourselves. Merci à la prochaine. Bisous.